Hello, guys. Um, good afternoon. Thank you very much for uh, joining uh, this uh, webinar. Um, we are waiting for, uh, well, uh, they, uh, they register about 15 persons, so they might uh, keep joining. Um, but, uh, well, uh, thank you again for joining this webinar about Christmas trees counting using uh, Soviagro. Uh, I am very happy uh, here uh, to see to introduce to you Igor uh, Tionov, who is the uh, Soviagro's uh, CEO. Um, uh, he will let us uh, know a little bit about the software. And then also Mike Byron, who is the uh, vice president of product of uh, Soviagro. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, there's also uh, Claudia, who is going to uh, be taking some notes and uh, Megan Cope, uh, who is uh, also part of, uh, of the team. So, um, Igor, do you like to introduce yourself? Uh, oh, by the way, we are recording this webinar. Yeah, sure. Um, so, shall Mike pull up the presentation? We have, like, uh, the first slide there about, about Solvi. <clears throat> uh, so, maybe I can talk to that. Uh, while Mike, Mike is sharing his screen, uh, but yeah, so I'm I'm the founder uh, and CEO of Solvi, um, and I founded the company back in 2015. Uh, Solvi is based in in Sweden. Uh, that's where I live. Uh, that's where the company was founded. Uh, Mike is on the other end of the world. Uh, is one of the our first employees uh, outside of the Sweden, uh, actually. Uh, but yeah, so. Mike, you unmute it and then uh, now you're presenting. Okay, good. Uh, so you can switch to the next slide. <clears throat> uh, so so here is uh, our history. Like I said, I found it uh, sold back in 2015, and it was a collaboration project with Swedish University of Agriculture um, that I've been working with, um, uh, helping them manage the, the drone data. Uh, so that's kind of how the idea was born. So for that collaboration, we developed the software, and the goal was to to make it as easy as possible to take the drone imagery from from different types of cameras and uh, turn it into something useful. <clears throat> uh, so the the product was released in 2017, um, and in the first version, you could stitch the images into the maps, uh, create the field level plant health maps, and then create the prescription files. <clears throat> uh, but from that point, we we have done uh, uh, a lot of development together with our customers and added additional tools and features. Uh, so plan counting and size estimation tool is, is one of those, which will be the main focus of this webinar. Uh, but then we also have uh, a whole suite of tools for, for the researchers, um, like commercial breeding companies, uh, educational researchers who work with tri field trials. Uh, we will show that briefly today as well because it's 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 uh, can be a bit relevant to to the high calculations that we'll be talking uh, about. Uh, and yeah, today Solvi uh, is used by customers a bit all over the place uh, of the world. Um, uh, so we have users in over fifty different uh, countries. Most of them are in North America and Europe, but we have customers in South America, Australia, and uh, yeah, a bit all over the world. Um, so that's briefly about us. Mike will uh, take over from here and, and uh, uh, tell more about the product. So, Mike, you, you are just muted. Uh, so, can you unmute yourself? I apologize. Yeah, I don't know why it keeps doing that. I apologize. So, basically, the process is pretty straightforward in terms of how yeah. Solvi works. Yeah. So, our platform is designed whereas uh, our customers collect the data, they fill the platform with the desired data, and we our platform accepts either RGB or multi-spectral imagery, either or works. So basically, you fill the data, you fill the platform with your imagery, and then you analyze based on our analytics. So you can apply vegetation indices to get health maps, prescription files, and you can also count, uh, do the counts. And from those analytics and insights, you can actually take those and action them in your field. So one of the reasons that we all are gathered here today is counting. Counting is a is a massive concern in the agricultural industry based on its labor intensive. And it requires a lot of additional steps to get accurate counts. Well, one of the benefits of aerial imagery is we can actually, at a very precise level, give you accurate counts across the entire field. 
So what I'll do is I'll step out of the presentation mode at this point, and I'll actually walk into the application and I'll walk you through how the process would work with a real data set based on Christmas trees. So let me get out of the PowerPoint presentation for one quick sec, stop sharing, and then I'll move to the platform. All right, here we go. Share my screen and we're back into sharing mode. All right, so what we're looking at right now is a Christmas tree data set. Uh, let me just go over here and turn off the counts for a sec. So as you can see, um, the, the way our software works is you have three panels on the left-hand side. This is our navigation bar. On the very first bar is where you access all of the, the base meta information on the imagery. Uh, you also then have the ortho mosaic. Um, you also have the ability to see the imagery and how the data was captured, right? And this gives you the ability to remove data that you don't need to process. But we move on to the elevation maps. And this is critical in terms of how our platform uh, does height calculations. And we'll show you that in a second. Um, and from there, you also have the ability to annotate. You can either drop notes of interest here that you would um, like someone to take a look at in the field to either field validate a result or to gather some additional information, or you can simply conduct measurements within the area. So if you wanted to see how far it is, you know, you have the ability to do whatever you want from an annotation perspective. So on the middle tab, this is where all of the analytics are generated. So the very first top up, the very first piece we're going to focus in on is our plant counting functionality. As you can see, not only do we can we capture the, the number of the specific trees, we also have plant level data that we can bring to the table that has a lot of value. So you can also, at a very you know, accurate uh, level, you can calculate the diameter of each tree, and you can also determine what those measurements are. So if you wanted to say that you know, all of the smaller diameter trees were 25 inches or below, you could easily do that. And or if you want to say, I want to make sure that all the larger ones are 40 inches in diameter and above, you have the ability to adjust the hysteria. Uh, you get the area, you get the diameter, and you also get the health. So this is based on the very index. So I'll move these over a sec. So at a glance, you would also, not only would you have an accurate count for you know, your Christmas trees across the field, but you also now have a decent understanding of where there may be some problem areas from a health perspective. So that is the plant counting functionality. Again, you have three different levels. It's very straightforward for us to conduct the counts. Um, I'll turn this off and I'll toggle on the plant health. Now, we're not sure how big of a use case this might be. But again, you have the ability to apply vegetation indices to the imagery to extract health maps, uh, sorry, health maps, and then generate prescription files. For RGB imagery, you're limited to three vegetation indices. But if this was a multi-spectral data set, you would have access to a host of additional vegetation indices to apply to the data. Um, so if we toggle off the data, we'll leave it on zonal statistics. This is where, um, Igor, would you want to sort of describe this, how this applies? I, I just wanted to, to just uh, a bit of additional information to kind of what's the difference between the plant health tool and the plant counts. Okay. Uh, so plant health tool is, is more like on the field level. So usually it's for, for cereal types of crops where you have like the full uh, canopy cover and you want to see the variations in the field. So it actually highlights where the crops are growing better, where they're not uh, growing uh, good. Uh, the plant counts health that Mike showed previously, it kind of removes all the information from like between the trees and all the focus is on the specific like tree canopy. So it kind of the same, the same idea behind that, it uses the vegetation indices, uh, but uh, in the plant health tool, it's like on the whole field level. So it actually calculates the health of every like square foot of the field. Uh, whereas when you're doing uh, like tree counts, you're not actually interested about like the, the whatever grows in between the trees you want actually to ignore that because that can skew the picture um so so then then the the plant health and the plant counting tools uses just what the 
system detect it as a tree and calculates the health of each individual tree. So it's more, more accurate data. Cool, thank you. And for the, for the zonal statistics, uh, would you want to walk them through how we can generate the, 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 the height calculations and how that sort of bends through? Yeah, sure, uh, sure. So uh, the zonal statistics tool was originally designed for, for the field trials. So it was, again, together with the Swedish University of Agriculture that I mentioned before. Uh, and the idea here was to uh, to make it really easy to uh, calculate different metrics for, for the trial plots. So when, when the commercial green companies, for example, are doing the trials, they uh, split uh, a part of the field in different plots, uh, and then they need to assess the different metrics of each individual plot. And it can be different types of treatments, it can be different varieties of, of corn or soybean, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, so, so that's that's where the zonal statistics uh, comes in. So there are different ways of kind of outlining the boundaries of uh, of the plots. Um, so there are tools to automatically generate like equally uh, the plots of the equal size, uh, but that's not so relevant here. Uh, but there is also a way of just manually uh, outlining a part of the field. So just draw the the, the specific area. Uh, mm -hmm. and then calculate different metrics for that area. Uh, so here, for example, um, uh, we can get metrics uh, re uh, related to the to the height. And this is not the height of the individual trees. It's the height for, for like height metrics for the whole zone. Uh, so what tells you here, it, it, what it tells you here is what is, for example, the average height uh, within this specific zone. Um, <clears throat> And, and to calculate that, we were using the elevation map uh, that Mike showed previously. Uh, so with every uh, drone data set that you upload into the system, we not only create the, the visual map of the field, uh, but also uh, the elevation map. Mm -hmm. I think it would be useful if you, Mike, go and show it what it looks like in this case. Uh, but I think you will need to switch over the plant health map first because it, yeah. sure. it will show about it. <clears throat> And the elevation, here we go, boom. Right. Uh, so, so the elevation map essentially shows how the height uh, or the elevation varies throughout the field. Uh, and if you collect the imagery of high enough resolution and with proper overlap between the images, uh, then the, the elevation map can turn out pretty detailed and, uh, and good and accurate. So if you zoom in, like uh, you will just see how like every individual tree here in the map stands out clearly uh, from from the ground essentially, uh, and behind that there is also uh, the raw elevation data. So every pixel in the imagery has a uh, elevation assigned to it. Um, so when calculating the height statistics, we're using that data to uh, to essentially calculate what is the uh, the average height within the zone, what is the maximum height within the zone, uh, and we do that by finding the lowest level uh, outside of the zone or within the zone. So that's what those different metrics um, that are called inside and outside height uh, mean. Um, so essentially, uh, we find those spots between the trees that are uh, have the lowest height values and then calculate uh, the height from them. Um, so so that, that's how the calculations work. Um, so at, at this point, like uh, in the plant counting tool that Mike showed before, like we just calculate the diameter, the area, and the plant health. Height is might, might be something that uh, will be added down the road. So individual tree height. Uh, but at the moment, uh, I just wanted to kind of show and explain how the zonal statistics tool uses the height calculation and what kind of uh, data is behind it uh, and see if there is interest for, for tree height calculations. And then maybe down the road, we can implement that in the system as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, and one of the other areas that comes in handy with the zonal statistics is you can also carve off your field to have accurate counts in specific zones across the field like some of the data we received from uh, christmas tree growers to date is they're very specific in the type of uh, trees are growing in specific areas and maintaining accurate counts on those zones is an ongoing challenge whereas this 
with this process, we can actually mimic and mirror your zones that you have in your field based on the types of trees you're growing in those areas. And now you can actually report accurately on the counts on those zones. So that's another ability that the zonal statistics brings to the table that, you know, Right. It's probably a huge savings because there's a lot of different variability in the zones. Interesting thing about Sovi is that you can collect uh, this imagery, uh, whether with an uh, RGB uh, drone or with a multi-spectral drone. Um, and just uh, yesterday, uh, DJI released the Mavic uh, 3 multi-spectral, which is capable of uh, mapping about 200 acres in one mission, which is pretty impressive, you know? Uh, so, um, uh, again, uh, one of the uh, best uh, features that uh, this platform has is that you can start uh, doing your uh, your counting just by using RGB drone. I mean, like, you would need a Mavic Air 2S, which is a one-inch sensor, uh, has a one-inch sensor camera, has uh, 20 megapixels, and that would be more than enough to get, like, very, very uh, accurate that data for the for the plant counting. Uh, we have, uh, we, we know that uh, uh, one person for uh, uh, will have to spend uh, eight hours and will count uh, no more than 10 acres a day, you know? And uh, we also uh, know that uh, companies, they have to pay these people uh, around uh, $30 uh, the hour. So uh, um, one day uh, they, they will have to spend around $240 uh, just uh, to count uh, no more than, than 10 acres. So of course, that if we multiply these uh, times the, um, uh, how you say, uh, times a, a five a persons group, then you can see that the payroll uh, can go like pretty high, can increase a lot of the, um, the how you say, the, the expenses. So uh, Solvi uh, can help you do that in a very, very uh, fast way. Um, Mike, maybe you would like to explain to them. Absolutely. Well, that's a good point that you uh, raised. Account? That's a very good, that's a very interesting point you raised because Lewis and I were having a conversation with, with a couple of Christmas tree growers last week about, you know, just what is involved in getting accurate counts. And to Lewis's point, they were giving us like payroll numbers, not exact amounts that they were paying their employees, but they were explaining that, you know, from, <coughs> excuse me, start to finish, there's an average amount of acres they, that, that the people can count physically in one day and how much they're being paid. When you look at how much it's costing in general, you contrast that based on our software and it's basically 50 cents an acre to count with a paid subscription. So if you have a subscription of Solvi, uh, and it could be in any one of our platform tiers, you know, your cost to count this is 50 cents an acre compared to 20 to $30 an acre for or 20 to $30 an hour for, a, for, per, for someone to actually manually go and count the trees. So there's a huge savings in just the time it takes to count. Um, and this is something that's rippled across a lot of different industries for high value crops. Uh, in hemp, it's the same type of an ROI scenario and same with agave in Mexico for tequila. Um, there's a lot of hectares of agave to count and they physically have to send people out into the fields on a, on a daily basis within two time periods within their season to get accurate counts on the agave. And in one scenario with one agave grower that we were working with, it was costing them $24,000 a year to count the agaves on 3,000 acres of land. So Ooh. if they were to buy our software platform, and to use the accounts, they would be saving close to, Lewis, I think, it, correct me if I'm wrong, 9,000, it was just like, I think, $10 short of $10,000. 912 uh, around, yes. So there, there's a, a, a sizable amount of ROI just on the counting alone. Now we also, as Igor explained too, like we understand that there's a, another big use case that's within the, the Christmas tree industry, and it's the height of the trees. Because that's, you know, to a, to a large degree, that is your forecast, you know, because the different trees go for different amounts. So ergo, you know, having an accurate, you know, number that you can relate to the size would give you a forecast. Um, as it stands right now, we can't do that. We can give you the, the ranges, uh, but uh, something that we're, we're interested in working on down the road, because we feel this would have a huge impact 
on your industry specifically. Lewis, that sort of covers off that. Uh, no, y yes, uh, uh, for for sure. And I don't know if uh, somebody would want to raise uh, any questions. Uh, Brandon, Joel, I see that Jeremy just uh, uh, connected. So, uh, would you like to to raise a question? Tell us uh, what you are doing. Tell us wh uh, why uh, you are interested in this webinar. Uh, I can start, Lewis. Okay. Yes, Jeremy. So I'm an applicator in, in Wisconsin, and uh, we spray and spread with production drones, and we also do crop health analysis. And uh, one of our big customers is a very, very large nursery, up to over 8,000 acres, but uh, uh, over 1,500 acres of that is Christmas trees. Uh, they, came, they approached me with the problem that Mike very well articulated here, um, that they want to know what the height is. Uh, in a 10 year lifespan of growing this Christmas tree, they're doing things to try to shorten that lifespan to get to a saleable height as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. So they're working through different uh, fertilizing situations and things of that nature. But at the end of the day, they drive around with a pickup truck and their cell phone videotaping the fields and then they go back to their office and they try to come up with an inventory how many and how tall the trees are at any given moment and obviously that's very 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 inaccurate so they wanted to know if we could overfly a couple times a year to give them an accurate count and height the shape of the tree is not such a big deal to them because they go out there and shape them by hand anyway right um but they really want to know like mike said the height is this this at what point they can sell it to, is determined by the height so they're really interested in being as accurate as possible and create creating a csv file that leads to a, a spreadsheet that they can analyze and there's my one question jeremy is there's zero correlation between the trimmed size and the height of the tree or is there zero once they trim it it's everything else is out the window that that's the way i understand it um is that when you are out there with machetes and cutting these trees you know it's it's just you know what the what the shaper is doing at that moment and and how right. that ends up so it's complete so there's so much variability introduced to that process I don't I don't know if there's any any correlation right. to when that can be sold. It literally is the the height and then they probably I'm guessing they have some kind of a grading system that says okay, this 10 foot tree okay. is more expensive than this 10 foot tree because it's bigger at the bottom or some I don't know I don't know what the criteria is, but I'm sure there's some sort of grading system, but the moment that they can sell it is the height. Right, right. And as you were explaining it, I was also thinking the additional added variability would be the the trimmers themselves. One person may trim tighter than the other person, so there's zero consistency at the end result. Correct. Right. I, I would imagine that's the case. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, so when it comes to measuring the height, uh, what would be the the error margin tolerance? What would be acceptable for them? That is an excellent question. Uh, we brought that up in a meeting yesterday, and I just haven't had a chance to connect with my grower on that, but I expect to get an answer on that very quickly. Okay, okay. Because like I can confidently say that, yes, we can measure the tree, but the, the question will be how accurate is it, right? Uh, and that will depend a lot on the imagery, because from the imagery we create this elevation model from which we can then extract this height data uh, but there are so many parameters, including like the re image resolution, um, the overlap between the images when you fly <clears throat> about the field, uh, that all can influence the, the elevation model and, and from that all the calculations. So technically it's, it's definitely possible to calculate the height, but the question is like, will, will it be accurate enough? <clears throat> so, Some, so that, someone. So yeah, someone yesterday brought up a very, very good point. It might have been Mike. I'm not exactly sure, but someone mentioned that um, when they go out with a stick to measure these trees and get an idea, 
there's a range. So on a five foot tree, there could be five segments of the stick that mm. is color coded. Mm. Um, so they're, they want to know if it is in stage A, B, C, or D, and that probably ends up to be within 12 inches or something mm. that puts it into a, a, a certain tier of tree mm. based on its height. So I can't imagine it uh, requires sub centimeter level accuracy or anything like that. But right. I, I guess I would say the more accurate, the better. It just right. it's just more valuable data. Um, but I can't imagine it has to be super super precise. One question that comes up in my mind is the leader of the tree. Right. You know, if sometimes is it going to pick up the leader and sometimes not. So I mean, a leader could be twelve inches by itself. I asked Igor that question, um, and based on, if we look at it from this perspective here, if I go back here, it would be really, the leader would be gone on this image. So I think Correct. we would have to always go on, the leader doesn't exist. So okay. if, the, there's a, if there's some sort of you know, regular recurring height on the leader, then that could be added into the, into the equation. Okay. Right. But if you switch back, Mike, to the plan council, um, like that that histogram there, that's essentially like the digital version of that stick. So you can define mm -hmm. multiple categories and you can tell what the boundaries for each category is. And then it will tell you how many trees there are in each category and what is the percentage of total. So um, question for the group, are we thinking that we're going to kind of go down the rabbit hole of of 3d modeling the trees or do we think that we can just get it from the rgb imagery straight down from the rgb imagery straight down uh what Igor okay. and I were discussing before the call this morning would be it would be wonderful to have a grower where we can actually work with from a case study perspective where we get the field validation on the numbers and that's mike mike that's me then the, yeah, the, i'm, Jeremy, I'm I can go that. out and I can gather the data, whatever we need to, at whatever criteria, altitude, things of that nature. And the mm -hmm. grower has basically given me part blunt to say, whenever you need to go in the fields, just do what you need to do. If it's going to end with me being able to have a spreadsheet of my trees, I'm all about it. He said, just whatever you want to do. Mm. So, what is possible to, to collect some samples like in different parts of the field, like so that we can cross-check from what our measurements are showing and, and what the actual measurements are so that we know that we are like within the <clears throat> acceptable uh, accuracy range. Yeah, so absolutely. Would, would to measure I'm, if you feel, I'm, if you mark them somehow in the images so, so that you can see it from above and then then we can compare the, the numbers. Absolutely. I can, I, can, I can definitely offer up the ability to gather data from the field. The current situation that we have right now in end of November in Wisconsin, we have about an inch of white snow on the ground. So um, that's kind of where we're at at the moment. I do have the data set that I sent to uh, Lewis that is about March. So you have a nice green tree and you have um, dead light brown grass around it as a contrast. Oh, I have that data so I can pull that up. Here, yeah. Um, how, how often do they do these uh, assessments? Is it once a year? Is it every second year? Or? He he made a comment to me twice a year. So I would mm -hmm. assume once or twice a year. The average uh, time frame to get the Christmas tree to saleable uh, is about ten years. He said, but again, True. they're they're trying to um, they're trying to fertilize and do and do certain things in a in a certain way that that reduces that 10, 10 years. Here's the data set, uh, Igor, that uh, Jeremy captured. Mm, right. Now keep in mind that those trees are now eight months older. Mm -hmm. So, um, right. obviously a little, little taller, but I'm not sure if that matters. But again, uh, hey, Mike, I was going to mention too, and you might have talked about this to Lewis, but yesterday uh, DJI just did put out a, that new multi-spectral yes. uh, Mavic 3M. Mavic so that's, 
that's kind of interesting, but I have the uh, Air 2S already, which I believe is the same RGB megapixel. I think it's 20. Right. Which one? 20 or 22. Yeah. Yeah. I was looking at that Air 2S, and it is the RGB sensor on the new Mavic uh, 3E is 20 megapixels. So yes. Well, the, the, the RGB on the Mavic 3M is 20 mm -hmm. megapixels. However, the four channels of multi-spectral are only yes. five are, are only five mm -hmm. yes so the phantom four was two now we've only gone up to five but i think you said you don't really want the multi-spectral anyway for counts like again like uh, an eager correct me if i'm wrong like for counts rgb and high resolution are the preferred for counts mm -hmm. multi-spectral for yeah. health for field trials and everything else Usually for, for the smaller crop, that's what we recommend. But actually, like for large crops like trees, um, like you can actually get away with multispectral sensor as well because they, they're just so big. Um, yeah, so one, one, um, um, I, I would also uh, like to uh, let uh, Laura, uh, Laura, Brenna, Joel uh, talk a little bit. So, uh, Brenna, would sure. you like to introduce yourself and tell us about uh, your uh, current problem? Um, hey, I actually work with Joel, so yeah. we'll, we we both are um, educators in uh, community college, and our uh, new project is actually starting to do agricultural drones, um, uh, mapping, terrain, uh, yeah. uh, data analysis. Um, so um, that's uh i mean uh anything that will uh, increase uh especially here in california where we have a ton of trees yeah. and yeah. farms that um any anything that we can uh help uh create better uh produce and, and, and we're, we're working we're working with a, a university farm as well research farm as well so we have access to about 325 acres from tree crops tree crops to uh to row crops so we're interested okay. in this and we're here to find out the technology that's going on so we can train our students and better prepare students mm -hmm. uh for uh, for what's coming yes right and uh, and also to add in if you guys have educational uh an educational portion of the uh, software i can we can contact you after the call on that okay yes thank you very much uh, Laura? Hi, everyone. I'm um, in Southeast Iowa, not too far from Missouri and the Mississippi River. Mm -hmm. I've been very interested in the agricultural aspect spring, but I think I want to go more with the mapping data analysis because it's just going to suit me personally. Um, where I live, it's flat land mm -hmm. and it's mainly beans and corn. Most of it is ground spraying and aerial. I have, I don't know anyone in this area who is doing any drone spraying. Um, the closest to me in Grinnell, Iowa, there's a there's a dealer, and also in Missouri. But um, I'm just inter interested in getting into that. Not less, not necessarily the spraying. I grew up on a farm, although. I didn't do that for a career. I was in education and immigration, but I want to come back to this. So I'm just kind of gleaning all this information. So I really appreciate the women webinar and such. Very cool. Thank you very much. And, and then it was uh, Eduardo. Hi, all. Uh, uh, thanks for inviting uh, for this webinar. Uh, in this case, uh, I am representing for a company in Spain, Tenidon System. Um, thank you much, uh, so much, uh, Luis, for for sí. for inviting for this webinar. I think this is the, uh, this platform for a cone plant. Uh, uh, I for for these uh, months uh, uh, we have a uh, more project and interest in uh, this this award. Thanks, thanks so much. Very cool. Thank you. <clears throat> awesome. And we haven't mentioned that before, but maybe you figured out because Mike was talking about agave plants and, and everything else. So so the, the plant counting tool is really flexible in terms of what kind of crops it works with. Uh, so we have customers counting everything from corn, soybean, uh, 
potatoes to Christmas trees to citrus trees uh, to different types of vegetables. Um, we are breeding companies using for for the for the vegetable trials where they count and measure every like leafy salad uh, individually. So Mike has a few examples here. <clears throat> Okay, here I would just li like to do a, a, a very small parenthesis. Uh, I heard that Brenda, Joel, and Laura they talked about uh, agricultural drones, you know, about spraying drones. Uh, a very interesting feature about uh, Solvi is that we can create uh, prescription maps according to the, the different vegetation indices. And mm -hmm. what we do with these prescription maps it is that we download um, a, a file, a shape file, and this shape file. We would upload it to the spraying drone to the agress, and the, and the drone will be spraying according to uh, this uh, to the head of, of the crops, you know, it, it, with variable rate application. And we have also seen that we can uh, also uh, do spot spraying. Uh, that means that we can uh, instead of counting uh, the plants, we can count or we can detect uh, the weeds, and then that way we can. Uh, upload again the, the shaper to the, the drone and the drone will be uh, spraying exactly uh, where, where it's needed. Uh, I have been uh, integrating uh, spraying drones and different uh, uh, software and sensors since 2019. Uh, so uh, and here in, in New Jersey, we have um, uh, a drone academy. So Laura and Brenna, I'll, I'll be happy later to uh, keep the conversation about putting together a, a, an agricultural program. Okay, thank you. Now's a good time for me to sort of catch up to what you were explaining to me, which is really cool. Okay. So uh, Lewis, did, uh, primarily our, our, our counting functionality is used to count row crops and crops or trees or whatever the use case may be. But another use case that is growing in popularity uh, along with the spraying drones is our weed detection or it's not really weed detection per se because what are what we're doing is we're training our plant ai to ignore the the row crops and only focus on the weeds so okay. what you end up having is you get a map of your entire field where all the weeds are so what you can do is you can export the shape file plug that into qgis to get the output that you would plug into the spring drone and it would then apply that you know, those spring um, functionalities to those areas. Um, in terms of counting the or for the prescription file for the more traditional approach, the way the software was really designed is it gives you a prescription file based on the health map of the field. So you have a lot of different, you know, variability or options in terms of how focused you want the spring to be. Um, 30 by 30 is the typical tractor, the boon on a spring tractor, but you, for, for drones, you can go down as far as 10 feet, you know, I wouldn't go down as far as three feet, but 10 feet gives you a really accurate picture of where you want to apply the treatments. And again, it's based on, you know, the plants, the actual underlining issue, like where, where the, the biggest issues in the field are. So you would then input the amount of, uh, product you want to display to spray in those zones and then you would download the prescription file plug that into the the system the variable rate system and away it would go um to igor's point in terms of crop very like the the variety of crops we can count this is an extremely powerful presentation because what this one is doing is it's actually counting uh harvested onions um for a lot of vegetables there's there's a, a specific use case which is very similar to the Christmas trees where size determines cost. So those are pre-market conditions that are set and you know the industry has to sort of align to those. So the same thing with onions. So depending on the size of the onion, like onions that measure 2.4 uh, Megan? inches in diameter will fetch a, are sold into a different marketplace the middle ones are sold into another one and then the bottom ones are sold into like a third party like food prep or something like that so growers around the world are always working against those defined market conditions so they're always trying to manage their harvest to optimize the size so this gives a farmer there's no way to really you know determine the size of anything because it's underground but once it's harvested 
he or she now has an understanding of what that harvest value is worth. So that's one use case for onions. Uh, this is agave. So this is a field agave in Mexico. And as you can see from a size perspective, it's extremely accurate. They know exactly how many plants within the field are within that, that diameter, this diameter and that diameter. So they know, right? But again, you can just as easily flip the diameter and go to plant health. And you could start looking at the field minus the ground cover, as Igor explained earlier. You could zero in on just the plants itself. Um, this one right here was the first data set that really blew me away when I first joined Solvi was this is cabbage. And cabbage has the identical predefined market condition as most other uh, vegetables have, the size of the cabbage. So this is a grower in Europe. And as we can see, Solvi, because cabbage, we can clearly see the, the center, the unique identifier of the cabbage plant, we can oh. then give a, an extremely accurate count across the board. So not only will we give you the diameter or the area, but again, okay. Okay. oh, this, oh, uh, sorry. This data set here was processed before we did the update. So the update applies the health uh, index to this data set if we reprocess it. So again, um, doesn't matter the crop, we'll count it. So it doesn't have to be Christmas trees. It can be any crop on the planet that is can be clearly defined against the rest of the crops within the field. Uh, and this is from a, if you look at our customer base, I would say a good 50% of our customer base is in research ag. These are large pharmaceutical companies, seed companies in, in that genre, as well as educational research uh, for Joel and Brenna. There's a big chunk of folks that do educational research as well. So the second biggest group in our customer base would be crop consultants and agronomists, uh, people who service multiple growers. And the very smallest segment of our customer base would be end growers. Um, and of that, they're typically specialty growers, like you know, they would be Christmas trees because we have a couple of Christmas tree customers in Europe. They could be, you know, whatever that would be, but they're they're traditionally not a grower that has like 10,000 acres of soy, soybean, right? They're more or less like someone who grows flowers or it's that genre. So when we look at that, you know, based on the fact that a good chunk of our customer base deals in field trials, you know, our analytics around field trials are, are fairly accurate. So this is a, a research plot on winter wheat. Um, and right off the bat, we get the health, turn off the health, we go right to zonal statistics. So what our zonal statistics platform does is it gives our customers the ability to apply a lot of different analyses and analytics to every single plot. So you pick and choose what analytics you want to apply to each of the plots. Once you've decided what those are, you then calculate the, the um, statistics and then each one of those plots is going to generate all of the data that you ask the platform to calculate for you. So this is like, it's the bread and butter for field trials in terms of what they do with their, their aerial imagery. Uh, the plot detection, if there is a clearly divisible line between the plots, we have a, a software that will detect the, the, the plots uh, automatically, but you can create the plots, you can import the, the zones. We have a lot of different functionality around that. But the, the biggest takeaway from our zonal statistics is it allows you to, at a glance, evaluate the different areas of the field. The outputs of this is also, you can generate a CSV file. And that CSV file then gives you, you know, actionable data on every single one of the plots. Um, Igor, do you have anything you'd want to add to that that I might have missed? No, I think it's good. I think it's good. So um, I think uh, Jeremy mentioned in the beginning of the video, uh, good to have a CSV file with all the trees mapped out. So, so we actually have a tool like that. And that's uh, where I'm leading this to exactly. Yes. The short summary is that you can use a pretty much all types of crops as long as you see the individual plants that you can like visually count. Uh, and the way it works is like it's a whole different topic, but essentially you tell the tool, you outline a few examples of the plants that you want to identify, and then. Uh, the AI uh, behind the scenes will, will be trained and detect all the similar plants. But that, that's like a, 
uh, a separate topic so that we'll probably not have enough time to cover here but um, mm -hmm. Well, there are two ways to, uh, which might be of interest as well. Within our uh, system, we have two methodologies for conducting counts. You can go through the process, as Igor explained, where you actually send the training sets into the AI to conduct, to process accounts for your data set, or you can request the, uh, the counts from Solvay. And in either instance, the, the results are the same. It's just in one scenario, we're doing the counts, and the other scenario, you're doing it. It's pretty straightforward. Um, from a, a do we have any questions? Uh, mm. <clears throat> this is always the awkward part of a, a webinar where we're asking, "Hey, anyone have any other questions?" But we <laughs> get it. Um, Lewis, is there anything else that you feel would be valuable to bring into the conversation? Uh, no, well, uh, here is where people uh, should ask some, some questions and we will be answering them. Uh, so if there is no questions, maybe we can. I'll, 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 I'll start, I'll kind of start with one uh, in, in applications of this, because I'm coming, I'm coming more from a, from an educational training side and giving our students, uh, giving our students the ability to, to have a, uh, to have a portfolio that, that, that they can go out and, and uh, sell, uh, do you mm -hmm. do you guys have a certification process uh, for using it for the uh, Solvi Solvi certified pilot or or uh, uh, a, a mapping specialist? Uh, we don't really have a process at the moment. No, mm -hmm. uh, that's the short answer. Um, well, you know. What I would add to that is, yes, we don't have a process for certifying anyone on a platform. Uh, the yeah. platform, all of our all of, all of our customers, we walk them through a training session, uh, basically okay. getting them comfortable with it. Most yeah. of the questions come, in all honesty, Joel, around the how high should I fly? You know, how should what are my settings for the drone? A lot of it's around the capture. Um, okay, because from our perspective, we yeah. Our business model is we sell the application. So our assumption exactly. is that yeah. people fill it. Um, but we also have to support the QA track around how they fill it. So we're pretty proficient at walking people through, oh, here's what you need to do here, here's yeah. what you need to do. We also uh, we published a, a blog recently, How High Should You Fly? And we what we did in terms of generating, you know, the the information for that blog is we just extrapolated all the questions that we've been asked over the last six months relating to you know questions about how they should capture the data and we put that into the blog so it answers a lot of questions plus um, we've also partnered with a, a drone pilot network in the us called air tello um, and the the owner of that network is actually a licensed faa instructor but at the same time you have uh, lewis here who that's what he does. He has the training center and he trains people on it as well. Yeah. Now this, I, I see this as really kind of a powerful thing of, of basically giving drone drone business owners the, the the benefits of an agronomy background, not necessarily having one, because the software does so much in it. Mm -hmm. And in my my main concern in it is basically having a number of drone only people coming into this. It's like, what? Uh, how can we give farmers and growers confidence uh, that that they're going to be good, getting good data? That's kind of where I come from educationally. So, mm -hmm. very cool. Okay, very cool. Yes, uh, we can definitely uh, help you. Uh, uh, you know, putting uh, putting together uh, an agricultural program. And uh, next uh, January, uh, I was telling Mike that I am going to take um, a course at uh, Purdue uh, where uh, they are giving us some precision agriculture uh, lectures and, you know, uh, experience. Uh, uh, as Igor showed, uh, he has been working on this kind of uh, software since 2015. I have been, my background is in, in renewable energy, but I have been working with uh, this kind of software since 2019, also with spraying drones. So we can definitely uh, help you uh, put together something interesting. <coughs> oh, yeah, that'd be great. So if you have, we can talk uh, talk afterwards. Yeah.
Sure, cool. Yes. Well, Lewis, Jeremy, I want to for I, he, I, I might have a question. I might have a question. Um, this this would be uh, more for Mike. So, Mike, from the software software side of it, obviously, you guys are are in it are in it to sell seats. I'm I'm the other half of that equation. I'm the guy in the trenches, out in the fields with the growers. And um, somebody mentioned, you know, an agronomy background. Uh, I grew up on a farm myself. I think somebody else mentioned that too. But my career went into engineering, so it did not go into agronomy. I'm coming back to this in a, in a position where I say, okay, you know, I saw, you know, Mike tells me this software is amazing. I've seen some examples. It it really is powerful. Okay, so then there has to be a connection between this powerful software mm -hmm. and the and the farmer that's standing out in the field looking at the drone, going, "Oh, that's really cool." But what can it, how can it help him? He has no idea. I don't know the software well enough to actually sell him value in counting or, you know, I, I do some multispectral, but on a, on a more basic scale. But if I, if I have the ability through the software to collect data and have outputs to send to whoever his agronomist is it might be a crop consultant might be a co-op he might have an agronomy degree himself the grower mm -hmm. but it connecting the dots i guess is what's going to make everything successful you guys know what your software does mm -hmm. i can go out and collect it and i have the the resources and the networking with the growers and the yeah. grower wants as much yield as possible so everybody mm -hmm. in their own silos is doing a really good job. Yeah. The silos sometimes aren't totally. talking to each other. Totally. And where we see that um, is like when we sell to a proc consultancy, they typically have the capture component taken care of as well as the agronomy they, they can bring to the table to sort of help work with the grower on the outputs of the platform. So that segments on autopilot. Where what you're highlighting comes in, and Igor and I see that a lot, is in the DSP space, the drone service provider, where you know a lot of them don't even have that uh, agricultural background like you exactly. do, being raised on a farm. A lot of them, you know, they could be from downtown Manhattan, and they just they have their part 107, and they're flying a drone looking for business, right? So um, that is a good chunk of our customer base. So for those that they it's typically use case related, right? So their clients, what are their clients' pain points? So from a, if their pain point is counting, then you don't need an agro a degree in agronomy to sort of bring that value proposition to the table. Where, you know, I think sometimes there, there could be suspect in the transference of the knowledge is in the health maps. But again, um, from my perspective, when I get asked, because I don't have a green in agronomy, I just kind of, I sort of push the question back on them as well. You know, part of it is understanding outputs, but at a base level, if you're looking for just where in the field to focus the field validation component, if I'm saying there's a hot spot over here that it looks like there's something going on with the plants from a health perspective, that's a pretty good indicator. And that's still value that you're bringing to the table. So if I roll that back a bit, the way I would answer that question would be, I would want to understand very clearly the value that I'm bringing based on their challenges. So See, they, that, that's a good, that's a good point, Mike. And, and as I think about this, and as I talk to actual growers and farmers in the field, it, it becomes this cyclical conversation. Hmm. So the grower will be like, Oh, you got really powerful software. What can it do? And I'm like, well, what's your pain point? And he's like, what can you do? And I'm like, what's your pain point? Like we go around and around the circle because they, sometimes they don't even know, what, the, what their know. pain point is because they can't imagine that a piece of software could do something, some mm -hmm. particular um, function that it has. They they can't even imagine that, so they don't even mention it. Totally. Um, the way I normally traditionally get around that is asking questions. So I'd say, well, okay, great. So if counting was the use case, right, I would say, so, you know, how are you going about, you know, your stand count? How do you do that on an annual basis? Like, how often do you do that? Like, what are your pain points? How much does that cost you? So you can stay behind the pendulum on those types of uh, topics by drilling in, by asking more questions. Every time they give you an answer, you can drill into that answer with more questions. 
right? To, because yeah, I guess I guess I use a uh, I use crop monitoring and this kind of stuff mm -hmm. with the multispectrals is kind of like a a little bit of added benefit. Obviously, we are out there applying spraying and spreading. That's the main portion of the business. This other right. thing is just a value add. So you know what what I what I'm aware of and what I talk to folks about is kind of two things: the the plant counting, right. You know, if that's valuable, and I also talk being about able to use a multispectral to possibly identify a stressed area yeah. before you could even see it with the naked eye. So, obviously, with any kind of aerial inputs and a pest control program, the e the quicker, the faster that you can identify the problem, the easier it typically is to take care of. So, mm -hmm. those beyond those two factors, uh, seeing stress early on the in the crop or plant counting, what else What else might be some possible um, use cases for the software? And I, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna get too deep into it. I'm just kind of asking, is there some sort of a, you, you mentioned the blog, but is there other things that, that we can read and, and try to come up with more value add to these growers? Hmm. It depends on the crop. So even the plant counting tool, like as we discussed, it's so different from Christmas trees to agave plants, where you just need these assessments every every year or twice a year. Whereas if you're counting corn plants, there the counts are needed for potentially like the, the planting decisions, corn soybean, for example, in the spring. So you map the establishment, you see the areas with poor health, and based on that, you can decide do you need to replant or not. In vegetables, it's a different use case. You don't really replant the plants there if you see that the establishment is poor, but you can see all the uh, all things that have gone wrong during the plant establishment uh, phase and uh, potentially improve like in the next plant round. So it's so different depending on, on 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 the crop. So each crop will have specific use cases. Uh, I would say. And especially if we're talking like trees, multi-year crops, and crops that are planted every year. What about uh, what about citrus crops? Are you able to citrus or, or some orchard crops? Are you able to count fruit or fruit densities? Yeah, that that's the question we we get asked sometimes. Uh, <laughs> the the challenging part is here that you don't see all the fruits from from above, right? You will have. You, well, you 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 would have a distribution. Basically, you you could see a target, a top target, and then you could possibly do a distribution across the the, the height and and get a mean, uh, or at least have a standard deviation and a mean count of potentially how many fruit you'd have on there. Okay. Okay. Well, then, like the answer is like if you can see it, you can count it. So if you fly low enough and can see the fruits, then then it will work. Uh, I can mention one of the examples. We have one customer who is a flower grower, uh, and he he was counting peony flowers on the like, bushes. Yeah, he had to fly quite low, but that would be kind of like a similar application. So as long as as like the 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 real challenge is just to capture imagery detail enough, okay, so that yeah. you can see the, the fruits, then it should be possible. I just want to circle back, and that was a great response here too. Uh, Jeremy, I want to circle back because there, you asked if there's stuff literature. We do have a, a crop uh, scouting schedule. I'll just show you this right here. Um, this is something that, you know, is widely used across the industry. So I'm saying it gives you when and where you would want to capture the data and deliver the value. So it's something that, you know, this is a decent, I'll, I will share this with Lewis, who will share this with everyone who attended the webinar today. So, but this gives you a decent understanding and it also has some, some context for, you know, exactly what you're looking for in terms of if the farmer says, well, what does that do? Well, you have the information here as to, well, this is why we would do this at this time of the year. So not that it's going to be a silver bullet for, for every scenario, but at least it'll, it'll equip you with a few more talking points for the value. Mike, that's perfect. That's exactly what I was looking for. Cool. Yeah, I'll we'll get this to Lewis as soon as the webinar is over, and he'll he'll send that out to everyone else. Um, Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. And Jeremy, what I'd like to do is maybe you, Lewis, and I could schedule another follow-up call because 
like Igor and I, well, Igor not so much because he's not on the phone as much as he used to be, but um, like we talk to people in your industry all day long, all week long. So we have a pretty decent understanding of the pain points that you experience delivering the value because that's the same conversation I have, you know, but it just is a different, you know, avenue through the, you know, who I'm talking to, but it's the same challenge at the bottom of the conversation. So yeah, I think we can. Yeah, uh, that, that would be good, Mike. Um, also, uh, partners and I are developing a software uh, for the for this egg spraying industry mm -hmm. that uh, collects all the information, the telemetry, all the pilot information, the customer information, rates, what products you're putting on, and it auto generates the reports that are required by a Part 137 from the FAA and your state egg. Really? What I'd like to do is possibly look at having uh, proof in that record. So you you go out and fly the multispectral, and and from Solvi you you bring in that photogrammetry and and the analysis, and store it along with the telemetry of the spray drone. So basically, you're saying this is what the crop was. This is the pest, ten acres of weeds or whatever, we sprayed here, and here's the result a month later. And you basically have that all in one record. I see that as a lot of value. Hmm. That's very interesting. So Igor, from your perspective, how do, does that look like something that would be doable? Um, like it, it sounds interesting. We will need to look like closer, like what exactly it looks like. Um, I don't know if you mean like in doing some sort of integration, Jeremy, or is it just like just as a comment. Yeah, I was I, I don't want to drag everybody down this rabbit hole in this in this call today, but yeah, I'd like to talk about it and be able to pull that imagery after the photogrammetry has been completed and the analysis. So pull that imagery into mm -hmm. the software to have it as a side by side mm -hmm. comparison to where the spray drone right. actually went, the telemetry from it. Right. Yeah. yeah. We can I can mention that we have the API. Uh, so certain parts of the product can be integrated with so you can fetch them. yeah if you have an api yeah that'd be great yeah we talk about that um basically we're doing that today right but it's a completely manual process right so you right. have to go to the farmer and you show them pictures you took and you show them the multi-spectral imaging and then they agree you go spray and then you have to go back to them again and show them on your phone or tablet or whatever email it to them it's a really really manual process and i think it could be all streamlined Right. Yeah, and that would and, and that would sell itself to to getting other farmers in on this because you could you you would literally be demonstrating, hey, this is who we've been serving for over a year, the past few years, and we can show the the uh, the yield improvements. Absolutely, that that's spot on. So in one record, you have your pest, you have your state pesticide record, you have your monthly FA Part One Thirty Seven record, you have mm -hmm. all the details, the weather, the telemetry. And then you have the proof. This this was the the this was the stressed area. We sprayed for that weed. Now there's no more stressed area. I mean, it's the whole picture in one time. Yeah, definitely worth a follow up call. Um, what we'll do is we'll 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 sync up afterwards, Jeremy, and we'll definitely get that on our calendars. I think if if there's a an addressable market and it's something that we could bring to the table to help, as Joel said, then absolutely for sure. Perfect. Yes. And then one, hey, one little side question. Oh, sorry. No, no, uh, sorry. I was just going to just had one little question. Um, uh, does it does the software do um, topographical maps? Because I also see a few customers that asked for us to overfly, give them a topographical map so that they could identify low spots in the field um, when the crop was off. Does it have that ability? Yeah, so we don't have it as a like specific topographical output, uh, but you can export the elevation model. Um, so one option is the just the visual one that Mike showed like on the map, so you just see things standing out. Um, but then you can also export the DEM, so the actual one band geotiff uh, with the raw elevation values. And I think it's pretty straightforward from that. Uh, do a CAD model. Yeah. Uh, can I say again? Oh yeah, and, and get it into a CAD model, so you can have an elevation. Yeah, or, I think, uh, or import it into something like X4D. 
Yeah, I think at least in QJS you can you can generate topographical maps from that. Uh, so you will see this curves with different altitude values. Um, Perfect. So, so yeah, the data is there, and you can export it uh, and and uh, process in other software as well. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Uh, uh, Paul Cox, um, I, I saw that you joined the conversation a little bit late. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your interest in, in this webinar? Your mic is muted. Paul Cox? No? Except okay. Away. Yeah. You might not be right in front of the computer as well. Yes. Cool. Well, hey, Lewis, I think this is this was a good webinar. Um, I hope everyone got some value of it. I also want to thank you for putting it together as well. We we really appreciate your efforts in the area and we want to support you with all of these as we can. Yes, of course. Thank you. No, uh, on the contrary, thank you very much for uh, uh, backing uh, the, these kind of conversations and happy to keep doing it and to uh, bring more um, people interested in, in digital agriculture. You know, I think that there's a lot of uh, things to do uh, in, in, you know, in, in, in this field. So I'm always happy to collaborate and work uh, with high quality people as you guys. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Well, I hope everyone has a great day. And uh, Lewis, I'll be reaching back out to you shortly. And uh, yeah, okay. have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.